it's gonna be a long episode. If you see me drinking coffee at the beginning of a video, in fact, if you see coffee in the thumbnail of a video, you know it's gonna be a nice long episode. Hey, what's up guys? My name is Eterno. Welcome back to my Game Engine series. So last time we talked about smart pointers, references. We talked about assets as well. Check out that video if you haven't already. And today we're gonna to start off by actually creating probably our first actual asset type, right? Like we've got shaders and we kind of consider them as assets potentially and geometry that we've kind of created in our engine. But today we're actually gonna load a file from our computer. It's gonna be any file that you guys create yourselves. We're gonna load that in and we're gonna display it in our engine. So this is really exciting because if you haven't, if you haven't watched my video on what game engines actually are, literally the first episode of this series. So if you haven't watched it, I'm, I'm quite disappointed in you. But in that video, we talked about the fact that engines are really just these kind of tools that we have. We write all this software, this kind of engineering effort goes into this software, this program, which takes data from our computer and transforms it into some interactive like graphics adventure that we see on the screen. That's really what a game engine is. And today we're finally taking in a piece of data that isn't generated from within like our engine or anything like that. We're gonna be loading in a texture, just a normal image file and actually displaying it on our screen. So that's super exciting. So I have a video on textures uh, in OpenGL. So check that out as well if you haven't yet. Um, that's gonna be kind of the basis for what the kind of code we write here. Although the code we write here today is gonna to be a little bit different, specifically the OpenGL code that we write here today. Um, I mean, we're also gonna set up like our standard kind of abstraction and everything like that. Um, as we've done with like different uh, renderer primitives, as I call them, like, you know, vertex array and shader. But um, specifically, like the OpenGL code is going to be different because we'll be using a bit more of the updated API, which I'm not quite sure Windows 10 wants me to restart. What's up with that, by the way? Like, seriously, almost makes me want to switch to Mac, you know, not really, but almost. This whole OpenGL API is honestly such a mess that I don't even want to spend too much time talking about it, but, but we will be using something a little bit newer than um, what we did like in that OpenGL series, specifically to do with texture loading. So I want to talk a little bit about what textures actually are and what they're used for in a game engine, because um, textures are extremely powerful. Textures are very powerful. Textures are more than you might think they are. You might be used to textures just being like, okay, well, I, I've, got, I've got an object like this bunny, for example. This is why I've got the bunny here, so I can do things like this. We've got this, we've got this bunny here, and I want it to be green, and I want it to kind of, maybe the ears need to be some other color, and I just want it to be more than just like one solid color. So how do I do that? Well, I'll just kind of create this 3D model in a program such as Blender or Maya or 3D Max or anything like that. And then I'll texture it. I'll add like a, a create, basically I'll, un, I'll unwrap the UVs and I'll flatten it onto a texture and I'll paint that in Photoshop and I'll just have my nice little bunny. And that's that's correct. I mean, that's probably the, the first use of textures that comes to mind. But textures can be a lot more than that because what textures actually are, um, what they actually are is just, just a buffer of memory that we've taken and uploaded to our GPU and now it's stored in our VRAM. And we can access that buffer of memory in our shader, specifically in our fragment shader, in our pixel shader, when it's time to determine, you know, what color to shade a given pixel. So because it's just a buffer of memory, we can upload anything into it. I talked a little bit about, about buffers, like our index buffer and vertex buffer, and how like, you know, our vertex buffer isn't just for positions. We can put any kind of data we want into there. Textures are exactly the same. You could literally, you could put anything you want into a texture, and then when you sample that texture, apart from getting all of the specific GPU technology that goes into sampling a texture and determining like, you know, what color to kind of interpolate it into if we're doing magnification or minification, filtering or an isotropic filtering or any other kind of filtering when we actually sample a pixel and we determine what color to return from that texture image, we get all of that bonus kind of data if we, if we want it. And then also um, we just have the ability to, in our shader, just select that kind of specific region of a texture and be like, I wanna know what the value is. Now true, in many cases, the value is the color. For example, you know, maybe our bunny's fur color is brown. So we'll just get that brown color out and now our, our bunny will be rendered as brown. However, we can encode any kind of data we want into, into it. A really good example is normal mapping, right? Where what we've done is, We've wanted to keep our bunny model kind of low poly so that we don't have to just have this hugely high poly, very heavyweight, very performance um, expensive uh, like model, 3D model with all of these little details. Instead of doing that, we create a texture, which is just basically a little 
collection of values which define more finely the normals that go into this bunny and that high resolution texture with all that kind of normal data and it can actually help our bunny look a lot more detailed and a lot more realistic because when it's time for us to do our lighting calculations instead of relying on the vertex normals we can actually just go ahead and sample that texture and figure out what the normal actually is for a given pixel on kind of a per pixel basis instead of like a per kind of vertex and then interpolation and then all of that stuff. So really powerful stuff and we'll cover normal mapping of course eventually in this series as well but that's just a little bit of an example and I could go on and on I mean there's you know in, P in physically based rendering PBR rendering there's like you know roughness maps metal maps there's all this other stuff that you can do as well to define what areas of the bunny should be shiny and what areas should not be shiny right and all that is is it's just a texture but really that texture is there because we want to look up a value when rendering a given pixel inside our shader and that's kind of what a texture is. And again, like to bring up physically based rendering, again, to give you one last example, there are certain mathematical operations that are very difficult to do in real time. So we can actually do them offline and then store the results in a lookup texture, in a LUT essentially, in a texture, right? And then all we have to do is in that texture, we've stored all of these already pre-calculated values. We can just extract the one that we want and that's it. We suddenly don't have to do that calculation at runtime. That's what we do with like a BRDF lot or something like that, right? So that's another little example. And we'll get into all that stuff in the future in a lot more detail. So if you don't understand um, any of this, that's totally fine. The point that I'm kind of trying to drive home is the textures are so much more than just a bunch of colors that we use for directly taking those colors and then applying them to a 3D model. All right, so now that we've discussed just what textures are and what they're used for in a game engine, let's talk about what we're actually gonna do today specifically. So what I wanna do is load an image file from my computer and then I wanna render that essentially on like a quad inside our engine. That, that's it, I mean, how hard could that be? There's actually a whole lot of components that go into that. First of all, we need, to talk, we need to talk about our geometry. So what is needed to display a texture on our computer screen, right? Like what data do we need in the geometry? And specifically what I'm talking about is we need texture coordinates. Again, I don't wanna really go too deep into this. Check out the OpenGL series video on textures because I think that goes a lot deeper than what I'm gonna do right now. But essentially what we need to do is modify our vertex buffer so that it actually includes texture coordinates for every corner of our square. Um, then we also need to uh, have a, we need to change our shader around so that it takes in like a sampler 2D, which is basically just a, a 2D texture slot. Um, and then we need to create a texture class, obviously, that will load that file and create an, and upload it to our GPU. Um, and also we'll get a renderer ID out of that that we can just bind at runtime using an API that we'll create. And then that I think should be it. So it shouldn't be too difficult, but there is a lot of work that's gonna go into this. I don't wanna make this episode too long, so I'm gonna just go through it as fast as possible. It should make a lot of sense. It should be really straightforward. If it's not, then make sure that you check out that OpenGL texture video. Um, and if it's still not clear to you, leave some comments below and I'll try to make additional videos for things that, that I might have missed that you might be, um, that, that might just need a bit more explanation. So without further ado, let's jump in and take a look at textures in our engine. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is prepare this area kind of for texture. So we're not even gonna to touch textures yet. We're just gonna make everything else basically ready to go. So if we take a look at what the Hazel engine is at this moment, all it is is this triangle. I think I'll get rid of that triangle. It's getting a bit annoying. We've got this grid, which is fantastic. We might keep the grid, but what I want maybe instead of this triangle is a nice big square where we can actually render our texture. So to render a texture, we need to render it on some kind of geometry. So we've got a um, vertex buffer here, which contains a square, which is fantastic. That's what we'll use. However, what I'll do is I'll hide this triangle. So this is us rendering the triangle. I'll just label it here so it's more clear. This is us rendering our grid. Literally all we need to do is take this submission and instead of submitting, um, we'll change the transform around so that instead of it being uh, tiny, I think what we're doing is we've got a position which is fine. We can just leave it at the origin. However, the scale um, we did set to 0 0.1, which is kind of uh, small, obviously. Um, I think one, one is the size of that triangle, which was also a little bit small. So what I'll do is I'll, just um, copy and paste this scale transform, but I'll change it so that instead of one, 0 0.1, um, it's 1.5. Uh, so it's a little bit bigger than just 1.0 um, scale. So we're scaling it up a little bit. Uh, we'll still keep the flat color shader and the square vertex array. So if we launch this right now, we are setting the color to blue here. 
So we should just get a kind of like a, a large blue square kind of in the middle of our screen. And here we go. So there we go. Uh, we've got this blue square. Perfect. So now what we want to do is instead of render the color blue, we want to sample each pixel from a texture so that we actually see our texture on the screen. So to do that, the first thing we need to do um, is uh, change up this vertex buffer so that it contains texture coordinates because without texture coordinates we actually can't render anything because we won't see, we won't actually know which areas of the texture need to be sampled. So for the bottom left corner, this is the bottom left corner, we'll just use 0, 0. Uh, for, the, uh, for the bottom right corner, it'll be 1, 0. So we're just going along the positive x axis here. I'll just copy this quickly. Um, for uh, the top right corner, it's just going to be um, one for X and one for Y. And then finally, for the top left corner, we're back to zero X and we're still on one Y. Now this is expanded now. Instead of us having three um, floats per vertex, we have five because we have two more for our kind of 2D texture coordinate here. Um, let me just check that that's right. And yep, that looks good. Okay, so basically, I mean, the way, the way that you can follow this is if the negative 0.5 is negative, right? If the 0.5 is negative, then the texture coordinates should be zero. And if it's positive, then it should be positive. It should be positive one, right? So one for positive, zero for negative. Um, and that way we can quickly check to make sure that everything is correct and it is. So we need to expand this now. Um, obviously we still have square vertices and the size of square vert vertices so we don't have to touch anything here. For our layout, because of our beautiful layout system, all we need to do is just literally add another um, uh, add another attribute here that's going to be a float2 and that's going to be called a text chord. All right. Um, and that's it. I mean, if we just launch the program now, it should be, it should look exactly the same because uh, we've expanded our vertex buffer, obviously, but we've also expanded the layout correctly. And the fact that we're not taking in anything inside our vertex shaders is totally fine um, because obviously uh, the position still remains at layout zero and it still is a VEC3. So if we hit F5 to just quickly verify that everything is correct, we should still see the exact same thing as before. All right, and now we've got the same result as before, fantastic. So what I wanna do now is create a new shader that's going to be our texture shader. So what I'll do is next to flat color shader, I'll make a new uh, shader that's gonna be called texture shader. Um, and then what I'll do is literally copy and paste this entire flat color shader, including the shader creation, like this. Now we're getting a lot of shaders now, so it would be a good idea to start thinking about some kind of asset manager or some kind of shader library so that we don't have to define all this stuff inside our sandbox app. So that's definitely something that we'll talk about uh, soon in the future. Um, so we'll have texture shader vertex source, texture shader fragment source. This is going to be um, M texture shader. This is gonna be, um, of course, our texture shader fragment source and our texture shader vertex source. So great, we've created a new shader. Now we can edit this code and it won't affect our blue shader, our flat color shader. So we don't need to output position anymore. What we do need to do is actually take in that second attribute, which is our vector, um, which uh, is our, all of our texture coordinates, right? Per vertex. Um, and then we need to actually get that texture coordinate and send it to the fragment shader so that we can access it there. And the way that we do that is the same way that we were sending position before. We simply write out vec2, then v for varying underscore text chord, okay? Um, instead of outputting position here, we're outputting our text chord. And then this gel position stays exactly the same. So in the same way that we output it here, we need to input it here. So we just use in vec2 text chord. Now we have access to that texture coordinate in our shader. And now what we can do is actually see if they're even correct, right? This is a really important thing uh, for us to do because it lets us verify our data. What we're gonna do is take those texture coordinates and the same way that we output our positions kind of as our color um, in uh, some previous episode, we're gonna do the same thing with texture coordinates here. So what we're doing is, uh, this is a VEC2, right? We're outputting it as our color, specifically the first two components of our color become this texture coordinate. So the red channel and the green channel correspond to the X texture coordinate and the Y texture coordinate respectively. For the blue channel, we've just got zero, so we won't have any blue at all ever. And for the alpha, we've just got one, and that doesn't change obviously 
at all. So now what should happen is if I render using this shader, what I should see is a visualization of this data that I've put into my vertex buffer. So this is a great way to actually verify that the data that you've actually provided is correct, because obviously inside our shader, we can't print anything to the console or anything like that because it's running on the GPU. Um, and so the equivalent of doing that is kind of just basically outputting uh, the color onto the screen, which is really cool because you can also validate it visually, which I think is even more useful than if we even could print it. So what we'll do now is we'll do the same rendering, but instead of flat color shader, we'll use our texture shader and we'll hit F5 and see what happens. All right, wonderful. So now we have a really cool gradient here that is a visualization of our data. Now, how do we read this? We know that the bottom left is zero, zero, right? The top left is one, one. If we look at what we've supplied for our texture coordinates, um, we know that the uh, bottom left coordinate should be zero, zero, right? That's exactly what we see. We see it being completely black, which is zero, zero. Uh, for the right side, right? So this is the bottom right. We should be 1.0 in X and 0.0 in Y. Now X is being output as the as the red channel, and then Y is being output as the green channel. So we should have zero green and full red. And that's exactly what we have here in the bottom, bottom right corner, we've got full red, no green at all. Now, if we look at the Y axis, what we should have is for the top left corner, which is this, we should have no red at all and full green, which is exactly what you see, of course. We've got full green, no red. And then finally, for the top right corner, which is one, one, in terms of our texture coordinates, we should have full red and full green, which red and green mixed together give us yellow. So you can see how that worked. Now, this whole thing that I've just demonstrated is super important for you to get a grasp on, because this is how you're going to be visualizing any kind of data that you actually write in, in your shader and making sure, not just visualizing, but validating any kind of data on your shader, making sure that what you've actually done is correct because as this series goes on and we start exploring 3D rendering and 3D lighting and physically based rendering and all these kind of rather advanced, I guess, shader algorithms that are going to require a lot of maths and a lot of mathematics kind of validation because we need to see mathematically, not just visually, here's a reflective sphere, cool. No, we need to see visually whether or not what, our, what we've written and all of our maths, whether or not it actually works out. And that might involve looking at every stage of our equation outputting it as all of these values so that we can actually visualize them as colors on our screen. And that's kind of what we're doing here. So this whole thing is really, really useful. Um, pretty much every engine out there is gonna have some kind of tool for validating this. Like for example, your normals, you might wanna output a normal instead of rendering, rendering your 3D model with full color, you might just render normals only. So then now you can see all the colors for your 3D model and that way you can validate whether or not the normals that you've actually provided are correct because if you get some weird colors, you'll know it's wrong. So for example, in this case, if we messed up, so instead of making this um, one one, we made uh, this kind of this bottom right coordinate one one. If I hit F5, you'll see a completely different gradient and you'll know that it's wrong. Okay, so gone is this smooth gradient, right? We get this weird kind of thing here where the bottom left, of course, is zero, zero, but now the bottom right we can see is one, one because it's yellow. The top right seems to be the X coordinate is on one, which is correct, but the Y coordinate is flipped because the Y coordinate is zero. We've got no green here at all. That way we know that it's wrong. This is still right. So really we can tell just by looking at this and this kind of comes with experience as well. But if you, even if you don't know what it should be, you've never seen this before, you don't know it's wrong, just think about what it should be, right? Because I can tell just by looking at this, that this is zero, zero, that's correct. That's zero, one, that's correct. But these two are flipped because this should be one, one. So we should have full green and full red, which should give us yellow, but we don't. This is where our full yellow is, right? And this should just be red only and no green at all. So I know that these two are flipped. Um, if we look at how we render this, this is like our first vertex, then our second vertex, our third vertex, and our fourth vertex. So clearly the second and third vertices, their texture coordinates need to get flipped. So these two, which is what I just changed, need to get flipped. And of course, we'll just do that by setting this to zero and this to one, and we should get the same result as before. All right, and there we go, that's perfect. So that is how you validate your data. Make sure you do this pretty much any time that you're doing kind of shader work. Again, not really necessary for something as simple as just trying to sample a texture and render it on the screen, but 
as we get a lot more advanced in this series, we'll be relying on this kind of stuff a lot. In fact, to the point where we'll probably develop like debug filters essentially, which instead of rendering our 3D scene, they'll just render everything as normals only or lighting only, or I don't know, vertex colors only or stuff like that, just to see exactly what everything is. And it could just, could even be as advanced as, you know, just, just render the environment map, just render, I don't know, just render the lights with no image based lighting, just do this and that, because that kind of stuff is really important for validating pretty much everything we do. Because in the world of graphics, everything is quite subjective, isn't it, right? Like, I mean, I'll show you a lit model. How do you know that that's lit correctly? Especially when you're dealing with physically based rendering, how do you know that it's physically based? How do you know that this is actually, that this actually make, makes sense? Like all of our energy conservation theories that we've done, they're actually, they hold true. You don't know unless you kind of visualize it and validate it using something like this. Anyway, let's get on with textures. So now that we've done that and that we, we know that all of our texture coordinates are working correctly, we can move on to actually loading a texture. So to do that, we're gonna make some new files. In OpenGL, I'm gonna make an OpenGL texture class and inside renderer, I'm gonna make a texture class. So we'll start with that. We'll just go right click, add new item. We're gonna add two files. One's gonna be a header file called texture.h. Um, and then we're gonna also add a CPP file going to be called texture.cpp. Texture.cpp will include our pre-compiled header and also our uh, texture header file. And then inside our texture header file, uh, which is this one here, um, we'll just use namespace hazel here and we'll make a class called texture. Now what I usually do is I'll split up textures based on the type that they are. Um, even though some textures, like all textures will have certain properties. So what I mean by that is we will have different types of textures. Like this could be a 2D texture, it could be a cube texture, it could be a lot of different things. And because of that, um, I still like to refer to things as potentially textures because textures are things that have like a particular width and height. They can be bound, all of that kind of can happen to them, right? So um, they do have common properties. Uh, so what I end up doing is creating a base class called texture, which has things like, you know, uh, a virtual function like um, get width, right? Which just re will return um, the width of the texture. It might have, um, it'll have get height, you know, we'll have get format and other things that we don't really want to deal with today. Um, and then we'll also have stuff like bind, right? So we'll have virtual void bind like that. Um, so we'll kind of make this, and this is gonna be real super simple. It's not even going to have any kind of like static create function because it's just a texture. We don't, it's, this is just a pure virtual kind of abstract class. Um, it's not, um, it can't be instantiated because it just represents a texture. Now this is going to be an actual texture. It's gonna be our texture 2D. So what this is, is a 2D texture, right? And this will be a texture, but this will obviously still be um, abstract, just like our vertex array class, because it needs an implementation by a specific renderer API, which in this case will be OpenGL. So we don't need to copy get width, get height. This function, this this um class or this yeah this class will have this class will have uh all of the it won't override any of these at all because they'll be implemented in another subclass. However, if, if there's anything specific to just 2D textures that for example, doesn't apply to cube textures or doesn't apply to all textures, we would put that um, those functions in here. But really I think because get width, get height, bind, that's all we really need. Um, we'll leave them in the super class here inside our base class. And then um, in our texture 2D, 2D class, all I'll do is I'll just have a static ref texture 2D, right? Uh, create. Now what we'll do is we'll take in a file path um, in the future, we'll expand this API massively because we want to be able to create textures just from memory. We might want to create a solid color texture. We might want we might want to have a texture factory that will create things such as I don't know grids or gradients or solid colors or things like that um, because they can be really useful to actually um, test out. And and another thing we might have is an error texture that the engine generates. So. So for example, if a texture couldn't be loaded for whatever reason, the asset is missing, instead of crashing or displaying black, we could display like a very colorful grid maybe, or even a very colorful grid that pulsates or something, I don't know, something crazy. So that when you look at, when you launch your scene, you know immediately, oh, that texture is missing. Like magenta is another thing that people do um, for like missing textures or missing assets or anything like that. So there's a lot of things that um, will kind of go in here, not just necessarily loading textures, from a file path. Okay, so that looks pretty good to me. I think that's about it. Um, all we need to do, all we need to actually implement inside our texture CPP file is that create function. So I'll copy the create function. 
we'll include uh, Hazel, we'll include two things. We'll include Hazel Core. .h, uh, and we'll also include string because we need both of those things for this file. And then in here, we'll create the create function. So texture2d create. This returns a ref, so a shared pointer. Um, and then we'll basically just go to like vertex array and we'll copy, uh, sorry, not open gel vertex array, just the, our regular generic vertex array. And we'll copy this. Now, this would be a good time to also replace these with refs. I'm not gonna do that now. But that's definitely something you guys should do for homework, I guess. And then also something I'll do in some kind of maintenance episode. Um, we'll include this, we'll include two things. So we'll include the renderer.h header file. And then also I'll include platform OpenGL, OpenGL texture.h, which is uh, something that we're not going to, which is something, something that doesn't exist yet, but we're about to make. So OpenGL texture, and then we'll uh, forward that path down like that. And then of course this will return it, um, a texture. Instead of returning new, uh, a new texture will return a make shared OpenGL texture 2D. Um, and this will be, this will take that path in like that. Okay, so we end up with something like this. And of course, this we're about to create. So over here inside platform OpenGL, I'll add two new files. One is going to be an OpenGL texture.h, so a header file. And then the other one's going to be our CPP file, OpenGL texture.cpp. We'll include our PCH, we'll include uh, the header file. Back in the header file, we'll uh, include our texture. So Hazel, Hazel renderer texture. And then we'll make uh, the OpenGL texture 2D class. There won't be an OpenGL texture class, just texture 2D, because this will just be di directly off of texture 2D. The reason we have that kind of super generic base class is because sometimes it might not matter what a texture is. It could be a texture 2D, could be a texture cube. We don't really care because a texture at the end of the day is still something that we can bind, for example, um, and use. And then it's not really, it, we might not want to create two functions, one for cube, one for 2D to handle something as simple as binding. So that's why we have that. Um, this will have a constructor. One thing I forgot, by the way, is a virtual destructor. I'll add that in a second. Uh, but we'll have it take in a path. Then we'll have a virtual destructor, OpenGL texture 2D. Um, and then we'll basically implement everything else. So I'll quickly add that destructor. So virtual texture uh, destructor. We'll just leave it blank like that. Or we can actually set it to equals default to be a little bit nicer. Um, and then we just need these three functions. So I'll copy them, paste them in here, leave them as virtual, replace the equal zero with override, get width and get height. We can immediately just set to return width and height, which we'll create in a minute. Um, and then bind, of course, we will just leave as a const override. Okay, so return width and height, looks good to me. Um, we'll make a private set of member variables here. I'll keep the path around, not something we probably need too much at runtime. It's useful to have this for debug builds and for development builds of your engine because, for example, you might want to hot reload a texture. So basically what I mean by that is you recreate your texture and then you just save it and you export it again and then you want to immediately have your engine pick up the fact that the file has changed and then load that in. So you might want to retain the path for that. Whether or not the path should be in the actual texture is questionable. You could, for example, have an asset manager that handles hot reloading and thus it would maintain, you know, a path, like a map from a path into an actual texture, like instance, a texture object like this. We don't have an asset manager. So for the minute, I'm just leaving the path inside the OpenGL texture class. So width and height, um, I'm just becoming uh, uint 32 ts width and m height. And then finally, we'll have, we'll have the same for a renderer renderer id okay and that's all we need so um if i just go over here and uh use visual assist to create all of the me method implementations here we have them i forgot to actually have the hazel namespace we'll have to quickly fix that up i'll just get rid of hazel from all of these uh areas here okay and now everything is pretty good so we'll uh set the path to be the path 
Um, and now what we have to do is actually load our image. So one thing I'll do is just quickly include glad um, because we need to access the OpenGL API here. And then now we have the task of actually loading our image. Now there are a bunch of libraries that you can use. You could of course not use any library and just kind of load an image, write your own kind of decoder. Now, technically speaking in an engine as an engine asset, you probably wouldn't rely on any of the existing image formats like a PNG or a TGA or a, a JPEG. I'm not sure anyone who would use a JPEG, but anyway, my point is you wouldn't rely on those image formats. You'd probably make your own texture format, which you would build kind of at like build time through your kind of build pipeline. You'd create like a texture in Photoshop and save it as like a PNG or a TGA or a TIFF or something like that. Then load that into your kind of build pipeline and build that into like a hazel texture file. And then that's what you would load at runtime in your engine. That way it'll be probably in like a more optimal format that you actually care about. We're not, we're not at the stage of building a, a, an asset build pipeline in our engine yet. So we're just gonna load in PNG files for now, but in the future that'll probably be replaced. So PNG files, how do we load them? Easiest way by far is by using something called STB image. STB is like a library of various C++ like helper classes essentially, or well, they're not really classes, but you know what I mean. Utility functions that help us uh, do things in C++, for example, load an image and the STB image um, library, actually it's a single header file and it includes everything we need to load PNG images, JPEGs, a whole bunch of other formats. So we're just gonna grab that off GitHub and use that. Okay, so here we have uh, the STB library. I'll leave a link to this in the description. And over here we have uh, just one file that we care about, which is stbimage.h. If we click on it, um, you'll see what the file actually is. It's quite large, seven and a half, seven and a half thousand lines, but that's it. That's all we need to load all of these image formats. So we'll click on uh, raw here to just get the whole file. Then control A, control C to copy the whole file. We'll come back into Hazel. What I'll do is I'll actually put this into the vendor folder. So inside Hazel and then vendor, I'll make a new folder called stb underscore image. And then inside stb underscore image, I'll make a new item, which is gonna be a header file. And I'll call this the same file name as it was in stb, which is stb underscore image. Um, I'll delete everything from this file and paste in what we just copied. Now we have the whole file here. Um, all the license information, of course, is just here, right? I mean, this one is just free to use, of course, public domain, which is great. Um, these are all the uh, file types that it actually supports. So, you know, we have TGA, we have PNG, I mean, we even have JPEG and kind of, a, I think, a limited version of the Photoshop um, file format as well. So it also tells us what we need to do to make it work, right? So just somewhere we need to define this and include it, right? So that's what we'll do. So we'll set that up now, actually. What I'll do is add a new item. I'll call this stb image .cpp. We'll include our PCH, of course, because we have to. Um, and then we'll just copy and paste this example code and just paste it in like that, okay? So there we go, we've got everything here. Um, we need to set up a few things though in Premake to actually get this to work properly. So what I'll do is just uh, open up this folder in a uh, file explorer here, we'll go to Hazel. We will grab that Premake file, put it in here. If we take a look at what we've done to other files, what we need to do is make sure we compile this file, this uh, CPP file. So, I mean, we've added it to Visual Studio now, so it will compile, but we also need to make sure that it works with um, when we, whenever we want to regenerate a project. So what I'll do is just put in project name uh, vendor, and then, uh, I mean, we haven't done the whole vendor folder, so of course I'm not gonna do the whole vendor folder. We've done just GLM here, so we'll also do the same for um, stb underscore image, okay? So we've got the CVP, and we'll also do the same for the header file, just so that it is actually included in our um, project. And then we also want to include it as an include directory so we can use it throughout our engine. Um, so I think we had GLM here. We did kind of, we've got this this uh, little struct of everything here. So I'll do stb image here as well, which will be hazel, hazel vendor stb image like that. Um, and then all we have to do is inside our include directories, copy and paste this, add a little comma and just do stb underscore image, okay? So that's that should be everything. Just to test that out really simply, we could just come to our Hazel, uh, the root of, of our Hazel repository, rerun, generate projects, everything should generate successfully, and we can reload everything in Visual Studio to see if that worked. So now two things should happen. First of all, this um, stb image should be included. So we've got other stuff that's not included like this, for example, but you can see this stuff is. If we go to stb image.cpp, we should be able to hit control F7 to compile just this file. And inside our output, you can see that this should complete successfully.
And there we go. So now that's done and we verified that's working because we added it to the include directories, we should also be able to go into OpenGL texture and just type in include and then stb image.h like that. And then we should be completely fine with that, right? Okay, beautiful. So now we can actually load in that texture. So how do we use stb image? Well, the re really the only function that we care about, well, there's a few, but um, the only one we care about is actually just stbi load, right? So that takes in a const char file name um, it outputs X and Y being the dimensions of the image, so the width and height of the image that is read. It outputs the number of channels in file, and then there's also an additional parameter at the end called desired channels, which actually lets us kind of convert the image into the format we want. So if the image is like an RGBA, um, the actual file is like an RGBA, we can convert it into an RGB. So we can read it as an RGB, um, which is pretty cool. But usually what I do is leave desired channels as zero, which means it's not going to change the format at all. Um, and then we'll just we'll just see what the format is and then react to that. So, and this returns an STBI UC, which is just an unsigned char pointer, okay? So STBI UC, if we're being all cool and we wanna use their types, um, we have basically our data, which is our image data. Um, inside load, we'll just do path.cstring to get uh, the cstring of our path. X and Y um, and channels and file are output parameters. So we'll do width, um, height and channels. So we now uh, pass in a uh, me the memory address of width, height, and channels so that we can get that data out of it. Side channels stays at zero. Um, and if we take a look at STBI UC for fun, you can see that all it is is an unsigned char. Okay, cool. So there we have, that's it really. Um, if it doesn't work out, it returns a null pointer. So we can just do hz quarter set data and then be like, you know, fail to load image, um, just like that. Uh, to verify if that's correct, and then we can continue on with everything else. So um, STBI load unfortunately gives us uh, our the width and height as a as a signed integer, not an unsigned integer. So we then have to quickly reassign everything, um, and then channels we'll kind of just hold on to. We won't deal with that just yet, but that will be important for determining the actual format of the image when we upload it to OpenGL. Okay, so now the next step is to actually take this buffer of data and upload it to OpenGL, upload it to our GPU. So the first thing we'll do is actually use GL create textures to create our textures. It'll be a 2D texture, right? We're gonna create just one texture on the GPU. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll actually save that ID into our render ID variable. And then the next thing we need to do is actually allocate some memory on the GPU so that it, it can actually store all of this image data. So we'll use GL texture storage 2D for that. It asks us about what texture we want to obviously generate the storage for. So that's what our renderer ID is. The number of levels. So if we had MIP maps, which we're not going to deal with right now, we would basically have to work out how many MIP maps we needed and then put those, put those levels in there, but we'll just deal with one for now. The internal format being how OpenGL actually stores that. So you can change this into what you want. Uh, if we're using, for example, sRGB, you would use sRGB over here. Um, we're just dealing with a normal RGB 8 texture, which basically means that we're dealing with a texture that is RGB and it has 8 bits per channel. Um, and then I think that, and then the width and the height, right? So M width and M height. And you can see OpenGL wants unsigned variables here because it wants uh, GL size I. So that's another good, good reason for us to kind of store them as unsigned integers. Now that we've done that, we can actually uh, upload the texture. Before we do that though, I like to set some texture parameters, which pretty much are required. So GL texture parameter I. So for our texture, which is renderer ID, we wanna set a few parameters. So specifically, we need to deal with what happens when we render our texture on geometry that isn't like a one-to-one -one mapping. So basically, OpenGL will have to either shrink our texture or expand our texture. So that's called minification and magnification. So GL texture min filter means what kind of filtering will it use for minification. We don't need to deal with mint maps at the moment, so we'll just use GL linear for now and we'll kind of see what happens. Um, and then we do the same thing for magnification. So if we render our texture on geometry that is larger, so basically the geometry will have more, more pixels to fill than the size of our texture, we need to scale our texture up. What kind of filtering do we use for that scaling up we use linear filtering, which will basically just linearly interpolate to work out what color we want. Okay, and then finally now we can upload our texture. So we do this by doing texture sub image 2D, and we have a bunch of parameters here, quite a lot actually. So render ID is the first one. We have a level, so which level are we uploading? Just level zero here, because it's we've defined one level and that's kind of the index of the level, which is zero. 
the X offset and Y offset because this can be used to, to actually upload a partial texture. So you can, you can change a region of a texture that's already uploaded. Um, width and height uh, being M width and M height. The format, this is the format of the data that's incoming. So um, the image that we'll be loading will be RGB. So I'll just type in GL RGB. Um, you can get this out of channels, by the way, and make sure that if the channels is three, for example, it's RGB. If it's four, then it'll be RGBA. So we can validate that as well. Uh, and then finally, the, or not finally, but the type, right? So this is the type of data that you're sending to OpenGL. It's just a bunch of unsigned bytes, right? That's what our unsigned char data is. Um, and then the pixels, right? So this is where our data pointer actually is. Okay, that's it, that's done. That's all the OpenGL code we actually need. So now what we wanna do is once we've uploaded the data to the GPU, we no longer need to retain it in our CPU memory. Um, in the future, you can of course retain it if you want. Um, usually you'd have like a parameter being like, please retain this when you create the texture. But since we're not dealing with that stuff right now, we can just do SDBI free. Um, and then, and I, I think there's um, a specific function for this. And I think it's STB, is it image free? STBI image free? Uh, which will free, yeah, STBI image free, and then we'll use that uh, data pointer, and that will actually um, they'll actually deallocate or free that memory that uh, was used to actually store this on the CPU. Okay, done. So inside our destructor, we'll call gl delete textures. We'll delete one texture, and it will be our renderer ID. And then finally, for bind, what we want to do is use gl bind texture unit. So what this will do is bind our texture right, at a particular slot or unit as OpenGL calls it. So we'll just be binding at slot zero um, and we'll bind our render ID. Now, this is th this slot kind of refers to uh, what kind of, un I guess, texture unit we bind our texture into because you can bind a lot of textures. In fact, you will have to bind a lot of textures when you render something more complex. Um, and then you'll have to access all those textures kind of at the same time in your shader. So because of that, we have texture units so that we can bind more than one texture at once. Um, typically you would want to actually set the unit. So what I'll do is I'll create, um, wasn't going to do this now, but we'll do it. Um, we'll create a uint32 uh, parameter, which is going to be the slot, right? And that's what we'll bind our texture to. That kind of selects the slot that we get bound to. Um, over here, I'll put this into bind. And then in texture2d as well, I'll just put this into bind and we'll have a default parameter um, of zero, just like that. And I can do the same thing over here. Um, just so that if we don't specify a slot, it binds us to slot zero. Okay, cool. That looks pretty good to me. If we go back to our OpenGL texture class, I think we've got everything that we need to actually render this. Um, let's load a texture. So what I've done is I've prepared a little texture here. It's just gonna be a checkerboard. I've put this into uh, into the sandbox, in, inside the sandbox directory, inside our Hazel sandbox. I've made it a directory called assets and then textures, and then inside there, I've created this checkerboard.png file, which as you can see is just a, a, a checkerboard, right? Pretty cool. Um, this is a really nice texture te test. We can also test whether or not it's the right way up because the bottom left should be like a black square and the top left should be a white square because sometimes we can have our images, our textures uploaded with a vertical flip, which we, which we wouldn't want. And this texture is just RGB, not RGBA. And we can obviously validate that ourselves if we need to, but that's why I've used gel RGB here. Okay, cool. So now uh, let's just make sure everything compiles first of all. I'll just compile our whole solution here by hitting Control Shift B and we'll see if this works. Okay, so we get a few errors here. We've got a syntax error in texture uh, because we haven't, I think we have either, uh, yep, we have too many parentheses here. So we'll just fix that up. And we also have a new line in constant. So there's, yep, we forgot a closing um, quote here. So we'll just recompile with those changes and hopefully we'll be good. All right, looks good to me. So now what we'll do is actually load in that texture inside our sandbox app. So I'll come over here into sandbox app. I'll go to the bottom. Um, one thing we'll do quickly before we do that actually is going to our Hazel header file and just make sure that we're actually including this. So uh, maybe just under shader, I'll include Hazel renderer texture .h. Then back in sandbox app, I will make a Hazel ref. It's gonna be a Hazel texture 2D. Um, and then we'll call it M texture. Then over here, after we uh, create all of our shaders, uh, I will come over here and just reset our texture to be a hazel texture 2D create. Um, and, and by the way, you could actually store this just as a texture, that's fine, um, but we're storing it as a texture 2D. 
So we'll supply a path, which will be assets, textures, and checkerboard, checkerboard.png. And now all we really need to do to actually bind this is just before we render um, our actual square, we just do bind and then we can put in a slot or we can just keep it as zero by default. Okay, so that's everything done from the kind of texture side of things. Now we need to modify our shader to actually sample from the texture. Currently it's just looking up those texture coordinates, which is great. But now what we need to do is actually sample from the texture. So we'll get rid of this uniform, which is just doing nothing, doesn't really isn't used anywhere, that's our color. And we'll change this to be a uniform sampler 2D, right? Which means that this is going to be sampling a 2D texture. And we'll call this U underscore texture. And then our color instead of this um, will be texture, which is a function which lets us sample a texture. U underscore texture will be the sampler that we're using. So that'll be our texture. Um, and then we need to uh, basically provide it with a set with a 2D coordinate of where in the texture to sample from. So that is what our texture coordinates are used for. And that's what we'll use here. Okay, and that's it. That's done, right? That's all we need to do. Everything should work. It's really, really simple. Um, so now what we need to do and the, the kind of last unresolved thing is this actual uh, sampler, right? Because this sampler is not set. It's a uniform. It needs to be set. We need to set it from the, GP, from, from the CPU. So what we'll do is... The same way that we kind of set this up, you can see that we bound it and then we set our U color. We'll do the same thing. I'll just copy these two lines of code. We don't need to do this every frame though. So I'll just put it over here. Um, we'll grab this texture shader, we'll bind it. Um, and then instead of uploading a uniform float three, I'll just move this over a little bit so you guys can see. Um, instead of uploading a uniform float three, we'll upload a uniform int. And what this is, is our texture uniform, which is a sampler 2D, but a sampler 2D is just simply an integer. And specifically, it is the texture slot to sample from. So because we bound our texture at slot zero, right, that's why we upload zero as the uniform int here, because that's kind of the mapping that we have. Now, again, usually just to complicate things a bit more, usually you would figure out all of, the, all of these slots when you create your shader. So when you create your shader, you see, for example, there are four textures, you just add upon shader creation, just, just assign slots to everything. So this first, the first uniform will be slot zero, then the first uniform texture, the first uniform sampler will be slot zero, then slot one, then slot two, then slot three, done and dusted, forgotten about. Then when you want to render a particular, a particular texture and you want to bind it to that uniform name, it knows the slot that it has to be. And when you bind your texture, that's where it actually gets the slot from, from the shader because that way you'll never have any kind of, oh, whoops, I set the wrong slot. You don't want to do that stuff manually. Your engine will usually handle that automatically for you. And that's something that we'll do probably around the time that we actually create a proper material system. Okay, so that should be it. If I go ahead and just uh, hit F5, everything should work. Now make sure we're using the right shader, which we are, texture shader. Make sure that we're binding the texture. Um, yeah, everything should work. Let's hit F5 and see what happens. Okay, so we did get a compile error. Um, now I did forget that uh, this, doesn't actually, shader create used to return a pointer. This doesn't return a pointer, which is really nice because now all we can do is just say that m texture equals texture create. See, that's beautiful. We don't need to do dot reset and set the actual value. We just assign it to that shared pointer because it already is a shared pointer, right? It's a hazel ref, which is awesome and cleans up our code quite a lot. So let's hit a five once again and we'll see what happens. And check this out. So what we have is our texture. Now there's two issues with it. First of all, if we look at the original texture, black's supposed to be on the bottom, but actually it's on top because our texture has been vertically flipped. And that's just because OpenGL actually expects our texture to be given from a bottom to up fashion, whereas STB image by default reads it from kind of top to bottom instead of bottom to top. So we need to flip it. The other thing is it looks very uh, blurred. It doesn't look as sharp as this. Now you'll notice here that I'm actually at 869%. So I've zoomed in a lot. And the reason that it's still so sharp is because it's not actually filtering it linearly. It's just, it's not doing any kind of filtering at all. Uh, so we need to actually change our filtering type to get it to be sharp. So that's what we'll do first of all. So we'll go to uh, opengltexture.cpp. We'll change this and we don't really care about the magnification filter. That's if we make it smaller. The magnification filter is what happens when it gets scaled up. So we'll change it from GL linear to GL nearest and see what that looks like if we hit F5 everything should now be very sharp because it should just now be snapping to the nearest pixel instead of linearly interpolating and basically resulting in a blurred image. Linear, linear filtering is great for like images, for example, but definitely not for a, 
for something like this, where it's just two colors. So there we go, that looks perfectly sharp. Now we just have the problem of the vertical flip. In the future, obviously, we, we do wanna expose this to the API because you should be able to set what kind of filtering is used and whether that's like this kind of just scaling kind of filtering when we minification and magnification filtering and isotropic filtering, anything else like that should be configurable. So that will make it to our API in the future. But for now, we're just gonna leave it like this. The last thing is to flip. Uh, there's actually a really nice function called flip vertically um, on load. Uh, I don't even remember, it's stvi set flip vertically on load. Um, and it's just an int flag true if should flip. So we set that to one before we load our data. And if we hit F5, it should now flip it into a format that OpenGL expects, which is bottom to top. So if we look at what the result is, you can see we have our black square on the bottom, our white square on top, which is exactly what our image looks like. In well, I mean, I'm using Visual Studio Code to preview images because that's how I roll, but uh, in any image editor as well, you probably see it this way. So that is a texture on the screen. Pretty cool stuff. Didn't take that many lines of code either. It's pretty simple to do. Um, and we now support textures, which is amazing. Now there are a few other things I could talk about, such as like blending. If you try and load a texture with alpha, for example, because we haven't covered blending at all, we haven't even enabled blending. Uh, it's just, it's you're not gonna see that alpha transparency at all. There's all these filtering things. There's also supporting RGB and RGBA. What about sRGB? Oh, there's so many things. And we will expand on this because as I said, textures are extremely complicated, but I hope you guys enjoyed this rather long video. If you did, you can hit the like button. You can also help support this series and everything I do on YouTube by going over to patreon.com forward slash the channel. This is now my full-time job making videos for you guys and I wanna do the best job that I possibly can. I also want to stay in this job as long as possible without having to look for like work for a company. So if you could help support the series, that would be absolutely incredible because it's people like you that make this stuff possible. As a reward, you will get access to many things such as exclusive videos just for patrons. You'll get access to uh, a development branch where I've actually done all this stuff already. I'll show some footage from the development branch because this week I actually uh, finally published the kind of animation code that I did so that we actually have uh, skeletal animation working, which I think is pretty exciting. So as I kind of develop Hazel in my spare time and that's eventually where these videos will head towards, you kind of get access to that code just immediately, which I think is really cool. Next time we've certainly got a lot to talk about. I'll see you guys then. Goodbye.